Uh, hey! Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to Wildland Zoo. This week was meant to be our big South American tour. However, me being me, completely forgot that we have an entire side of the building here that we need to fill with a habitat. So today, a little bit of an impromptu additional episode before the end of this area. We are going to be popping on a Jaguar habitat to the side of our as of yet unnamed South American building. Before we do, however, just want to bring your attention for those that have not seen it, that the poll for naming our wonderful building here is now live on the channel's community tab. Make sure after the video here to pop on over and vote for what you believe we should be naming our new building. That being said, as always, if at any point during today's video you enjoy yourself enough to feel like you want to reward me, please ensure you do tippy tap the like button. It makes more difference than you could ever know. If you're not yet subscribed, don't forget to jump on and subscribe. And as always, today's emoji is going to be the leopard, purely because there isn't a Jaguar. Make sure to pop it in the comments below, all for the sake of engagement. And with that, let's hop, skip and jump into the episode. So the area that we're looking at today is this left hand side of our South American building. Now, originally we did plan out to put a habitat here. That's why we have this big window. And as you can see from our planning squares way back when we planned out the building, there always was meant to be something going in here. I completely forgot, but luckily enough, we caught it before the tour. So what are we putting into this habitat? I hear you ask. Well, that's quite simple. We're going to pop in one of the main predators of the South American area, the Jaguar. And because it's a solitary animal, we can then go for quite a smaller habitat. So we're going to start off by building down into the ground just to bring a area of water just to marry up what we've got inside with the outside. I'm going to keep jumping inside just to have a quick look through the window just to see how everything looks. The main idea of this habitat is to be viewed from within the building so it's important that it looks correct from inside. Once we have the landscaping done we're going to jump over and use the mud pillar trick to build ourselves a steel dome and we're going to build that using the steel mesh pieces surrounded by some cables both of them tinted a rusty brown to match the British weather. Then once we have our little square mesh panels, we're going to bring them up, tilt them by 15 degrees and then variate them along the upward curve of our dome. All that really means is that we're going to create this nice big curve piece and we're going to keep tilting it inwards until we get a nice flat top. And all we're doing is making sure that the lower square sections line up perfectly with each other. That will guarantee that we get no gaps all the way up along the edge of our sphere. And then at the top, we'll get a nice concentric pattern. Then once that's all done, we can go in, chop half of it away, and then just spend a little bit of time tidying up that upper edge. So we get a nice flat edge to fit against the building. Now it was at this point I decided we need a little bit more room. So to get that, we are going to pull it away from the building and add in some straight pieces just to take us across. And I think this worked out well. In the end, we just got over the requirement space for the Jaguar. And as you can see there, we get a lovely concentric pattern running along the top of our dome. Moving away from that for a moment, we're going to try something out that I've been wanting to give a go and finally saw an opportunity to do so. And that is a modular backstage. So we're going to do this by starting off with a concrete box and it's just going to be breeze block walls, concrete floor, roughly about the size most of our backstage areas are. Within this, I'm going to build essentially a little diorama. So within this box, we're now going to build ourselves a backstage set of cages. And because this is a big cat, a big predator, we're going to have a couple of segregated areas that we could open and close the doors to. That should help if we ever come to add extra animals or add extra, uh, say, breeding opportunities or if the keepers just need to separate the inhabitants. Now, the idea by building it modular is we could actually use this in other areas of the zoo for areas that we just don't have time or want to build a unique backstage to. A little bit of a spoiler, this turned out so well that I'm actually going to make probably a group of these that we could just clone and put in when we don't have time or want to build a backstage. 
A little tip I also found whilst building this was to never put the mesh in until you're done. So what I've done is I've built all of this framework and all of this skeleton out of metal beams. Uh, we've made the doors that can be slid along the rails as well as some metal electric drop down doors. And then afterwards we put the mesh in and that worked really well. It meant that I could line everything up a little bit better and it also gives us a nice final sort of tidy finish, which normally you end up with bits sticking out where they shouldn't or you're sort of hiding over some of the mistakes and there's none of that in this it worked really really well Now these aluminium pieces I am absolutely loving for doors. They've got this darker texture on the bottom, lighter texture on the top. Because they're properly metal they get a decent amount of reflection. You can also variate them up a bit so they don't just look one flat colour. You'll see them a lot used around the zoo and you'll also see them a lot in future builds as I am absolutely obsessed with them. We're also using the European marquee beams here just to add a little bit of differentiation. We don't want it to be all one colour metal. So we've got those plus our painted metal beams which form the main structure of our backstage. And here we go just popping in all of that mesh and the beauty of the squared mesh is you can line it up and get some perfect results. As long as you plan it out so you don't end just sort of half a square away from the end. You'll also see in the footage here that we've got some tighter mesh and that was made by just taking two pieces of the square mesh and squeezing it together. We're going to add in some very bright yellow handles so that they're very clearly marked as to where they are and what they do. And then we're also going to build ourselves a feeder box. Now this would essentially slide forward and backwards through the mesh so that the keepers do not have to go into the habitat to feed the animal. And we're going to make that using the conservation air vent which forms a very nice square trough. Now, as this habitat is outdoors, we're going to need a heater. So I'm going to put one in and then the rest of them are going to be a bit like in the main building, turned off, rotated round and set into the wall or the framework near the doors. And these would essentially be the motor control for our electric doors. Where we are clamping it on some mesh like we are here, this would just be rotated back on itself. So you can see it from both sides. And we can't have these motor boxes without some electrical cables. Now, we're not going to go too crazy in this one like we did in the main building. We are cheating a little bit in that the cables are essentially just running into the wall and disappearing. We're going to attach them on using the LED clamps. I'm going to run them up and down the cable just wherever it looks a little bit bland or to cover over any connections where the electrical cables don't quite meet as they should. One final bit of decoration is our chipboard notice board. We're going to add some clipboards to this as well as a couple of hooks for some tools. And this is one of the easiest ways of adding personality to the backstage without having to go too personal on the animals within. We're going to pop these around and also add a couple of tools. And then if we do use this elsewhere, we can just simply take out some of the tools, put different ones in or maybe put a poster on there nice easy way of just adding a little bit of decoration that doesn't make them all look the same but at the same time we don't have to rebuild this every single time. Now although this back area is not visible by the guests we still want to add a little bit of decoration for you the viewer so we're going to go in with some decals and just variate up the concrete color a little bit as well as add a couple of bits of mud and dirt around the entrance and the feeding area and then just to finish it off because it is a big cat enclosure we're going to have these portcullis metal, which when you add colour to them, looks like dried and flaky paint. I'm going to run them just as a safety line around the mesh to make sure the keepers do not stand too close to the mesh. Trimming up that edge then with a little bit of vent. This would be where the wastewater and the cleaning spray would get brushed into. And with that, we are done. and look at how good this looks from above and the fact that I can just put that into any enclosure and surround the building with a decoration of my choice is brilliant and I'm really happy with how it's turned out. Now we're going to jump on outside and start adding a bit of theme to our habitat. This is going to be something we certainly expand a lot more on later on and something I'm going to go into a lot more detail on with next week's video. 
The main part of this is we want it to look like a zoo. We don't want it to look like a Mayan temple, but at the same time, a lot of the habitats that we've built so far are kind of boring. They're not majorly thematic. They're not following the area for a good guest experience. And that's something I really do want to start focusing on. So for this, we're going to dip our toe a little bit and bring a couple of ruins in. And we're going to use this primarily at this stage to cover all of that horrendous placement of exhibits. But we're also going to use it to mask the view of the enclosure from this side of the zoo and that's because later on we're going to have a food court out here and we don't really want people stood there seeing everything there is to see without going into the building now on top of our backstage we're going to just bring in some of that rubble we're also going to use this to cover up some of the openings and the gaps that have been created where we've merged the two buildings together on the inside i've gone in and covered up with brick on the outside, we are going to go in and cover in with these temple pieces. With the same mindset, we can also look at filling in the gaps where the metal meets the enclosure, as well as just covering in any gaps that have appeared. Just on the inside, just so we get a bit of that temple colour, we're going to make a little plinth underneath the window, as well as covering up the brick on the outside, so that when you look in from the front of the enclosure, you won't see the building. Finally, and this highlights a lot of the versatility of having these modular backstages, is we can start cladding this breeze block building in a covering of our choice, which in this case is going to be the temple brick. I did start off using painted temple brick for this, but I actually found the temple brick colour worked a lot better. Now moving on to a bit more detailing, we're going to recreate and enhance the support poles that we made last episode. So we're going to start off with a concrete pillar again and a big timber pole, but this time rather than having a single connection on the top, we're going to do a double and we're going to reinforce that using the these brace brackets or these pulley brackets and then we're going to angle them upwards and this is just going to give us a little bit more control over where the cables can go. Now I'm not going to make you watch me place all of the cables but I will just give you an outline on how they work. So on the ends of them here we have these brace brackets and then linked up inside them is an LED cap. This creates a rod. Now on that rod, we're going to put on one of the Oceania rope coils. So this will be our coiled up steel cable. And then from that, we'll use the Planet Zoo rough rope to make diagonal connection pieces. On the end of those connection pieces is a knot. And then that knot piece, we're going to try and directly attach to one of our metal beams. So we're going to squeeze it into place just a little bit and then you'll notice that it's a lot of rotation and movement to try and get them to meet up where we want them to sit. Eventually though we get it at the right angle and then it's just a case of extending and shortening the cable to make it reach the bracket. Doing that 10 to 15 more times later and we finally have enough support for our mesh dome. We're going to move on to getting the rock work sorted. So we're going to keep this fairly simple. We want a even mixture of tropical and temperate rock. The idea being it is outside. So a large amount of tropical plant life probably won't last very long in the Great British climate. Now we're going to start off by making a nice podium piece somewhere that the Jaguar can walk along, can sit on. And that's kind of going to be visible from both outside and inside. And the intention is this is kind of where you would want the cat to sit. And it's also where in a real zoo, you'd likely find a lot of the enrichment items are placed to encourage their behavior to go up there. We're going to do that by making this pile of rocks and then adding on one of the large Planet Zoo trees. Now, the Planet Zoo tree does have the ability to be climbed, but I have had nothing but issues in the past with animals trying to walk along this. So to make it a little bit simpler this time, we're going to use a climbable tree to get up, and then we're going to use multiple climbable logs running across the top of it for the animal to walk along. That way there should be no issues whether it is on the main log or on these little additional ones. Now, whilst we don't necessarily have to put these up here, I am going to put some climbable platforms on top of the backstage area. And the primary purpose of that is so that the Jaguar has something a little bit more comfortable to use as a seating area. And it also, again, falls in with that idea of following the more zooified method. They would generally put something up there that was going to be a little bit more rugged to all of the scratching, damage and waste matter, shall we call it. Then, with all the climbing done, it's time to get a few plants in. Now, we're going to keep this fairly sparse we want it to be visible from all angles and as i was mentioning we're probably not going to throw too many tropical plants into this habitat however we can get away with things like the strangler tree here as well as a couple of bracken and bushes so we're still going to stick to the tropical plants where and when 
One change, which I'll go into a little bit more on how this affects the zoo next week, is that there has been a bit of a shadow patch on Frontier's End, which means that you can now no longer use too many non-continent specific plants to the animal. All that really means now is all those habitats that we filled with buffalo grass will not work. The animal will not like it and you will get a mood or social modifier on the animal which encourages protesters and it just kind of ruins the idea of making really creative habitats in franchises. However, we'll do what we can with what we've got. So you can get away with a couple but we certainly can't go too mad on making this a big lush rainforest habitat. Finally, as you saw in the video there, we stole the fence from our capybara habitat last week. And I'm just going to add a few more British plants on the outside. So our hedgerows, a few brackens, and of course the ever wonderful nettle. All that remains is to pop a couple of weeds to the internal of the habitat, just where areas where you're unlikely to get the keeper in there with a lawnmower. So these are probably just going to be left to grow. And that brings us to our finished habitat. So here we go as we roam around it. The Jaguar model is getting a little old now, but still does its thing. And as I was referencing, the view from the inside, just as important as it is from the outside, it finally puts to work this giant window that we have on one side of our building. For a habitat that wasn't planned, and I wasn't aware I was needing to do it until the day or two before I would normally begin recording, uh, I think it's turned out quite well. It's certainly got a lot more of a zoo aesthetic to it, which is good. It's not as sensationalized as our South American habitats are, but I kind of like it. It's nice building something a little bit smaller for once. Now, as I say, next week we will have our regularly scheduled episode, which was meant to be this week, and that is a tour around our finished South American area, which is now completely finished. Additionally, we will be discussing what happens next, what we're going to do going forwards with Wildland Zoo and the channel as a whole. So I can't wait to share all of the news with you. As mentioned last week, I am off to Chester Zoo next week, and there will be bits of that filtering down into the series. Keep an eye on the community tab for photos and updates from then. In addition to those of you who have not been over to the community tab and check, we now have the poll up for naming our South American building. Now that this video is done, make sure you nip on over there and vote. If you enjoyed the video today, don't forget to hippy tap that like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and I will see you next week. Goodbye.